Yeah, we, we have five minutes before the students are uh, all in the classroom. No hurry. Everybody are you, feel um, comfortable. Are you um, all teaching in person or online this year? No, everything is online for the last now three semesters, basically since March last year. And uh, we were supposed to be back in India a week ago, but we again uh, the government of Haryana, where our campus is situated, extended the lockdown, so we cannot go back. And we decided to do that only next semester, which starts in February in India. Unfortunately, okay. we are missing the campus life for very long now. Of course, yes, we are back teaching. Um, in person this year, this semester. For us, we begin at the end of August, and so we are in the middle, towards the end of the first semester. And um, so we teach we teach in person, but uh, with masks and distance and everything. Last year, it was more distance, and people were half online and half in person. This year, everybody is in person, but we still have masks, and we have a, a compulsory vaccination. At, at least students are happy. The, the problem is that not so much for us, for the professor, it doesn't matter much, but for the students to miss the campus life with all its activities, sports, yeah. dances and Bollywood nights and concerts, mm -hmm. exhibitions. I, I really feel for the students who cannot enjoy the full campus life as, yeah. as we did when we were young. For the well, professor, and if it's three semesters already, it's a, it's a lot. Very long. Eh? Imagine yeah. somebody with an LLM lasting two years yeah. and being unfortunate to be exactly during those two years would have been a... Did I... Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Did I send you the wrong one? This I think I one, sent you the wrong one. This is the one I had. Hey, take no, no, time. no, no. This oh, is the wrong one. Oh, well. <laughs> okay. But I will keep it nonetheless. This is the, <laughs> the wrong one. This is something... Oh, this is about the code of conduct. Wait. Wait, what's the title of that? This is a code of conduct for adjudication adjudicators. Right, in but did I send it? Did I send you a, a, a folder called Gindel Society Dispute Resolution, Georgia? Or what's the title of this? Yeah, this is the one, Dispute Resolution, Gindel Society. Yes, the title is Gindel Society Dispute Resolution. And you're talking about the Institute group working. No, 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 no. It's obviously the wrong one. I, I, I obviously saved it twice. No, no. I wonder what happened. We have a discussion on on the reforms just on just just last week as well. We have Professor Jester Brown and Marika Paulson. So this is a oh, really? Follow -up. This is a good follow up <laughs> for us. Uh, they would be perfect then. But I was meaning to ask you about uh, uh, appointments in these international courts and the ICJ appointment of Professor Charlesworth and uh, discussion about that, but perhaps we can have that later on. Absolutely, I'll be happy to talk about this. Okay, I said something, I sent you one called the now, so you should be. It's funny because this actually this slide that I sent you was something that, I, that Professor Brown was also Chester Brown was there too. Oh, so. I'll tell him. I, I'll I'll share that with him. You have an incredible list of speakers. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. These, okay, are, all persons who, these are all persons who Professor Popaski has introduced us to his teachings. And no, no, and this is all because of Lankip <laughs> Malhotra. He, he did all the work. <laughs> I, I'm just introducing the speakers. He's doing all the correspondence. But yes, we, we are really privileged to have such a list. And I think also because it's online, it's kind of easier to bring people there. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I, don't I have some tomorrow. I used to work with Richard Falk. Maybe you remember mm -hmm. this uh, old professor in Santa Barbara who wrote a lot mm -hmm. on international uh, law and international use of force back. He was in the Kosovo Commission. He was in uh, the Gaza Commission and uh, he's now 91 years old. Uh, professor Richard Falk and I, I was up almost just trying again to bring him to a conference and I was very surprised he replied quickly and said he will join me tomorrow in a conference. So I think oh, because wonderful. of the kind of facility yeah. of Zoom uh, to connect people quickly. We, yeah. we have those. Did you get conference. it, yes, yes, I got it and um, I, it's downloaded in my system. I will upload it in uh, uh, request you to just confirm if this is the. Uh, well, it should be the, the right title, Reimagine, Reimagining International Dispute Resolution. So, uh, um, Vaseline, if, if I may, where, where are you joining? Where are you now? I'm in Bulgaria, my country, okay. uh, but all my students and faculty are in India. Although okay. we teach online, we we didn't interrupt our classes at, at no point. We are based okay. in different parts. Actually, Jindal faculty is all over the world. It's, we have faculty in the United States who sometimes find also challenging to connect night time mm -hmm. for them. Not easy, but we are getting where we are getting. Mm -hmm. Hopefully soon we reassemble in campus. Hopefully, okay. yes. Let's see. We have some students so already in the classroom. Of, so, so, so sorry. Uh, there are slides in the UN chart. That are, OK, now you can see it and tell me if this is the correct one. This is the right one. UN chart. You just go. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. So we can start. So we can start then. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Chiara, for making your time uh, for us. It's very uh, appreciated. We know it's busy time and uh, precious for all of you. Uh, let me introduce Chiara Giorgetti, who is a professor of uh, Richmond Law School and uh, also very. Uh, excellent writer. She, she got tens of articles and edited books. She published the Columbia Journal of Transnational Law, the University of Pennsylvania Journal of International Law, Georgetown Journal of International Law, and the American Journal of International Law. Chiara served as a member of the Executive Council and the uh, Committee of the American Society of International Law and co chaired the annual meetings that happen every April. She's a vice, actually I attended a few of those, but not very regularly. I think the last annual meeting I attended was in 2017, so four years back. We, we have a moot court uh, team of Jindal students and when, when they qualify for the final round, just at moot, we, we join them into supporting them that their final round and that's when last time I, I went into the American Society annual meeting. Chiara was the vice president also of the American branch of the International Law Association, chair of the Academic Council of the Institute for Transnational Arbitration, member of the Academic Forum on ISDS. Prior to joining Richmond, Professor Chiara Giorgetti practiced international arbitration in Washington, D.C., Geneva, Switzerland, and worked extensively with the United Nations in New York and Somalia. 
excellent career. We, we, are, we are full of expectations to hear from you, Chiara, today on the topic of reimagining international dispute resolutions for the 21st century. Again, our pleasure and privilege to have you with us. Uh, the format is the usual class of 90 minutes total. So take take as much time as you need in, in the initial presentation. And then we will moderate a question and answer sessions after that. Thank you once again and your, your time can start. If all the technical issues are solved, we are waiting to hear from you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Popovsky, and, and thank you to Professor uh, Merotra, and of course, thank you to Ankit, uh, um, also for Merotra for, um, for inviting me. It's really a privilege, and it's really wonderful to be here uh, and talking to you. We were discussing while we were preparing the, uh, the presentation, but the fact that uh, because we are all teaching online, now it's actually easier for to 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 establish and and to create uh, these kind of opportunities for exchange and um, and, uh, um, um, and 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 participation. And I'm really uh, delighted to have the chance to be here and and to be at the um, uh, with you uh, at the Jindal Society. Um, as uh, Professor Popovsky mentioned, uh, I'm a professor of law at Richmond Law School, and I really focus very much of my research in international courts and tribunals and international dispute resolution. Um, I teach those courses and, uh, and on the side I practice a little bit in international dispute resolution. Um, my lecture today uh, talks about reimagining international dispute resolution for the next century. But before we speak about the next century, I would like to kind of take note and uh, talk about the, uh, the background and what we mean by international dispute resolution. Um, what is international dispute resolution? Where are we now? And then yeah, at the end, we can talk a little bit about uh, my views for the future. Uh, thank you, Kate, also for doing my, the slides uh, because unfortunately I wasn't able to, to share my screen. So thank you very much. It is really very, very much appreci uh, appreciated. So as an international lawyer, the first thing that we do when we think about any kind of issue, we always look at the Charter of the United Nations, which I always keep in my little uh, booklet. Um, so next slide, please. So when we talk about uh, international dispute resolution, we talk about, uh, uh, first of all, we look at the Charter of the United Nations uh, and we see what does the Charter say? And Kate, next, perfect. Um, uh, what, do you, what, do, what does the Charter say about uh, the dispute resolution? Uh, well, the Charter says that all members have a uh, obligation to settle disputes peacefully uh, in Article 2.3. Uh, which uh, by peaceful means in such a manner that international peace and security and justice are not endangered. In Article 33.1, then the Charter says specifically that the parties of uh, in any disputes first seek solution by negotiation, inquiry, mediation, conciliation, and then arbitration and judicial settlement, which really is a kind of an escalation clause, meaning that you go from the very start to dispute settlement that are binding. We normally divide dispute settlement uh, mechanisms in two kinds. In one, we have issues that are not, uh, mechanisms that are not binding. Uh, so negotiation, inquiry, mediation, and conciliation. And then we also have uh, binding uh, um, mechanisms like arbitration and judicial settlement. Um, let's go into a little depth, but not too much, and describe uh, each one of these dispute resolution mechanisms quickly. Um, and keep next slide, please. So the first, uh, the first dispute mechanism, this dispute resolution mechanism that the charter talks about is negotiation. And negotiation means a discussion with a view to achieving common understanding or agreement, and can be conducted in many different ways: uh, by meetings of the parties, by correspondence, by phone, by video conference, or by email. Uh, next slide, please. The Charter of the, the, the General Assembly actually provided some indication, principles and procedure that should be followed for negotiation. Uh, and the general principles include sovereign equality, non-interventions, and negotiation has to be conduct, conducted in good faith. 
the resolution is resolution uh, 101 that was held in the 53 meeting of the General Assembly 99, and that provides a predictability of negotiation parties and reducing uncertainty and promoting an atmosphere of trust at negotiation. Negotiation is something that occur quite often. Next up is uh, inquiry. And in inquiry, the dispute resolution mechanism really focus on fact finding. Um, it's a method that disputes that try to dispute that try to, to resolve the disputes through facts. It's not an investigation on application of certain rules of law, um, and requires. So here we begin to enter uh, to see the entering of a third party. Here a commission of inquiry. The re there are reports as of the outcome of the proceedings, and the, is the, the report that is normally issued is a non-binding report. We also see a third party coming kind of into uh, facilitating this resolution mechanism in mediation. So when we have mediation, um, the, we have uh, a participation of a third state or, or, or states or a disinterest individual with the disputing parties in an attempt to reconcile the claims of the contending parties and to advance proposals aimed at a compromised solution. The many kind of mediation, a, a famous um, mediation, a successful mediation was the one that was uh, undertaken by former Secretary General of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, in the Cameroon-Nigeria boundary case. After the issuance of the ICJ decision on the Cameroon-Nigeria, uh, which uh, assigned the Bakassi Peninsula to Cameroon, there were some issues about how to transfer and how to ensure that the, uh, the boundary decision was, was enforced, and Kofi Annan uh, mediated that, um, um, uh, that, um, that, that mechanism and that, uh, and that solution. Next, we have conciliation. Both mediation and conciliation are actually more and more used in international dispute resolution. So, for example, mediation, we now have new rules of mediation in international arbitration. And conciliation also. Again, conciliation is normally non-binding reports, but they are becoming here more and more procedurally heavy. So here we have a method of settlement of international dispute of any nature according to which a commission is set up by the parties. And the commission proceeds through an impartial examination of the disputes and attempts to define the terms of a settlement that are susceptible of being accepted by the parties themselves. A famous example of conciliation is provided in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, in Annex 5, Article 7. Um, and you probably know, but in UNCLOS provides different mechanism of dispute resolutions, including going to uh, judicial settings, the ICJ or the, um, the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, but also includes conciliation. And conciliation was very successful in resolving a maritime boundary between Timor-Leste and Australia the first official uh, conciliation by an UNCLOS uh, conciliation committee um, and considered a very successful one. So in conciliation, then we have kind of the, 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 the epitome of non-binding dispute resolution mechanisms. Uh, and as I said, we have kind of an incremental, we have more and more the involvement of a third party and we have more procedure. We then pass to binding adjudication, and this is maybe what we normally think about when we think about dispute resolution mechanisms. So there are binding adjudication mechanisms, and we normally distinguish into two, arbitration and judicial settlement. Um, in arbitration, we have uh, the, the, the big difference is that while arbitration is very much ad hoc, uh, so we, uh, we have ad hoc tribunals that are selected um, for resolving uh, one dispute only. We have a consent uh, of the parties to go to arbitration and the parties also have to consent to the rules of procedure and are um, very much involved into the choosing of the rules of procedures and the, uh, the arbitrators. And the arbitrators uh, in the international arbitration, the awards are final and binding. When we think about judicial settlement, 
Instead, we think about permanent courts and permanent courts and judges. We think about fixed rules of procedures and judges not appointed by the parties, but judges appointed. Uh, and Ankit, if you want to go to the next one. Um, we, think, we think about judges not appointed by the parties, but judges that are, that are appointed uh, by uh, a neutral uh, organization uh, or uh, um, assembly uh, and that serve long term. Uh, so this is kind of very much the introduction about this resolution mechanism. I don't know if you want to have a, a, a pause and have this question here, or we can go to kind of the next section of, uh, um, of my presentation, which talked about where do we stand now? So when we think about dispute resolution mechanisms now, we know that there are there's been in since World War II, um, and especially at the end of the Cold War, a substantial proliferation of dispute settlement mechanisms. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. And when we talk about proliferation of dispute settlement mechanism, we talk about the creation of several international, new international courts. Um, and we talk about the establishment of many also arbitration uh, mechanisms. So we have the creation, for example, of course, after World War II, we have the creation of the first permanent uh, court, the International Court of Justice, which succe succeeds the Permanent Court of International Justice, which was part of the League of Nations. Uh, but the International Court of Justice is considered is the principal judicial organ, uh, judicial organ of the United Nations, the primus inter pares, as, as we say, between um, international uh, international courts and tribunals, uh, the sets really the format of what we know about what we consider international courts and tribunal. The proliferation then continues with the creation of many tribunals looking at criminal issues. Uh, the International Tribunal for the um, uh, for crimes committed in Yugoslavia, for crimes committed in Rwanda, for example, are two. We look at we have tribunals that look at specific issues, like the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and what that really signals is the desire to resolve dispute peacefully by uh, by parties, um, a desire to. Uh, respect the provisions of the Charter of the United Nations uh, and a desire to try and find dispute mechanisms that work in different ways to resolve, to resolve uh, international disputes. So the question is then, how can we distinguish when we have this proliferation of international courts and tribunals, how can we distinguish between um, and among all these uh, courts and tribunals? Uh, well, there are, uh, um, to, to me, five uh, uh, different distinguishing features of international courts and tribunals. Um, so these are not a, a kind of an heterogeneous uh, group that, that comprises only disparate international adjudicatory bodies. There are four and foremost legally binding. Uh, um, oh no! Can you go the, uh, before and Kate the one the slide before? Yeah, thank you. So international courts and tribunals, perfect. The international courts and tribunals share at least five common features. First and foremost, all international courts and tribunals have the power to issue decisions that are legally binding between parties. Some may also have an advisory jurisdiction like the International Court of Justice, but what defines international courts and tribunals is the exercise of an adjudicative function accompanied by legal force. The binding nature of this decision distinguish international courts and tribunals from other international courts and international bodies that review the compliance of state parties for certain treaties and convention, for example, quasi-judicial body like the Committee Against Torture, which monitors the implementation of state parties of the Convention Against Torture, or other human rights uh, treaty bodies. These bodies, however, issue recommendations that are not binding to the parties. Secondly, their constituent instrument is governed by international law. Uh, 
such as uh, international treaty or a resolution of the internet of an international organization. For example, the International Criminal Court, the ICC, was established by the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which was adopted in Rome uh, in 1998 by the United Nations Diplomatic Conference of Plenipotentiary on the establishment of international court. So it is an international treaty. Both the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, ICTY, and the International Criminal, Tri Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, ICTR, were created by resolutions of the UN Security Council acting under Chapter 7. Uh, third, international courts and tribunals principally apply international law to resolve disputes. And the international law that they, they uh, normally are called to, to um, apply is provided by Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice, which specify the sources um, that the court um, uh, has to use uh, in a, uh, uh, to resolve disputes. Uh, such as international convention, international custom, and general principle of law. And Article 38 is very much seen as a common sources of, source of law for all international courts and tribunals, in addition to specific sources as stated in their constitutive instrument. Fourthly, the judiciary, so judges and arbitrators, uh, so adjudicators of international courts and tribunals sit in their own personal capacity and are independent from any government or domestic court. Although they may be selected based on their nationality, uh, also as if for the same thing for the International Court of Justice, they act uh, independently. So for example, the statute of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, ITLOS, as I suggested, require the judges to be independent members of the tribunal. And we have similar requirement for independence and impartiality in all instruments that create international courts and tribunals. And finally, all members of secretariats and other international um, uh, and, and, and other international civil servants that staff international courts and tribunals are independent and do not take instructions from any government. Their conduct is regulated by conditions of service proper to the respective institutions. And in fact, there are also administrative tribunals, so part of these international courts and tribunals within organization that resolve disputes arising from personal, per, personnel issues. Traditionally, uh, there's a difference between court and tribunal was linked to the temporary nature of the latter. Uh, but this doesn't really uh, um, this this distinction doesn't really apply uh, anymore. So that the um, we we have tribunals that are now uh, um, the, it's, it's just an indication the difference between international courts and tribunals. Um, in the last few decades, there have been numerous new international courts and tribunals. As I said, some kind of a proliferation of courts and tribunals, including the ICC, the CTY, ICTR, ITLOS, and other. We also have several United Nations commissions. So, for example, the United Nations Claims Commission, the UNCC, or the Iran US Claims Tribunal. So, also tribunals that are set up to resolve very specific issues. The growth of this tribunal has not been organic and has not resulted in the formation of an international judicial system as such. So the International Court of Justice is not the Supreme Court of international courts and tribunals, and there's, there is really no hierarchical structure uh, within uh, international courts and tribunals. Still, it is possible to group international courts and tribunals according to different uh, characteristics. And maybe if you can do the next slide, please. Um, thank you. So first, uh, uh, the, 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 the international courts and tribunals can be grouped in relation to their subject matter jurisdiction. There are a limited number of fora that possess general jurisdiction and can hear cases that pertain to many different issues. So for example, the International Court of Justice had such a general ratione materia jurisdiction. Um, they have, um, they have the, the, the International Court of Justice has jurisdiction to resolve all general issues, all general matters, legal matters that are brought uh, by the parties. The similar general jurisdiction is also what can be assigned to tribunals from the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So the Permanent Court of Arbitration can serve as a forum to resolve disputes 
can refer a variety of issues for decisions by arbitral tribunal, ranging from boundary disputes to um, um, to pollution and, and other things. If you look at the docket of the International Court of Justice now, you really see very much the wide nature of the cases that are brought by uh, by states. So for example, only last week, the International Court of Justice uh, heard, uh, issued a decision on uh, the maritime boundary between Somalia and Kenya. And also just yesterday, we finished uh, hearing a preliminary um, a request for preliminary measures by Azerbaijan in a case against uh, that are against Armenia, but Armenia had brought also a case against Azerbaijan the, the, the week before um, on issues on violation of the Convention of the Elimination of uh, Racial Discrimination, I believe, third, uh, and uh, and other issues. It hears cases on the. Uh, um, um, on the use of force, on the violation of the Genocide Convention, and many others. The other courts and tribunals have a small, much more specialized, so there is a very specific subject matter jurisdiction. So ITLOS, for example, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, can only hear cases related to the law of the sea. A tribunal constituted under the ICSID Convention, the Convention for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, are competent to hear cases related to international investment. And the jurisdiction of the dispute settlement body of the World Trade Organization relates to trade issues. Several international organizations have also created administrative tribunals that are competent to hear cases brought by their employees. There are other bodies with specialized subject matter jurisdiction, for example, the ICC, the International Criminal Court, the ICTY and the ICTR, who are, which are all competent to hear cases related to the violation of international criminal law. Um, there are also regional courts. So, for example, the European Courts of Human Rights, the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights have specialized uh, jurisdiction on human, ri human rights issues, and they're mostly based on uh, regional, um, a regional framework. The international courts and tribunals can also be distinguished by their different personal jurisdictions. So the international jurisdiction, as we say, razione persone, Historically, international courts and tribunals were only mostly competent to hear cases between states. Nowadays, however, and this is very much an, a very important development um, uh, of, uh, of, of, the, of, uh, the, of the of international dispute resolution, uh, there are the jurisdiction of razione persona comprises also international other international law actors, including, for example, individuals on disputes relating to. Um, to investment or, uh, or human rights or criminal matters, international criminal matters, and also companies, mostly uh, for now, on issues related to, um, um, to investment. Of note, uh, the WTO uh, only hears cases between states and does not hear cases between, uh, brought by companies or individuals. So there are still courts that can only hear interstate disputes like the International Criminal Court or the WTO or LITLOS, uh, but many now have jurisdiction over by, uh, on claims brought by individuals. And this is an extremely important um, development, recent development. This includes the Inter-American Human Rights Commission uh, and uh, NAFTA. Um, the Iran-US Claims Tribunal can also hear cases brought by investors uh, and by individuals. Um, international criminal courts, uh, ICSID, um, and others, and in general, bilateral investment treaties uh, also. Um, courts and tribunals can also be distinguished by their temporal jurisdiction, so the um, razione temporal jurisdiction. Uh, certain courts have a general prospective temporal jurisdiction, uh, such as the International Court of Justice, ITLOS, WTO, and the ICC uh, human rights courts. Conversely, the temporal jurisdiction of others is limited to its retrospective, its retrospective, and includes, for example, the CTY, ICTR, the UNCC, um, the Iran US Claims Tribunal. Um, and finally, sorry, although this is above, there's a territorial jurisdiction that also varies, uh, with some courts having only a regional mandate, uh, for example, human rights courts or courts of regional economic uh, and political integration mechanism. 
Although if you look at the, uh, the jurisdiction of the European Court of Human Rights, we can see also how it struggles to define the territorial scope uh, of its uh, um, uh, it, it, the territorial scope of its uh, of its mandate sometimes. Um, and and the ICC also has some very interesting uh, issues of, of territorial of territorial uh, jurisdiction. Um, other courts like the International Court of Justice, the uh, ETLOS and the WTO uh, don't have re uh, regional jurisdiction restrictions, but they really work. Um, they have a mandate, a global mandate. Um, next slide, please. So this kind of describes a little bit where we stand in terms of international jurisdiction, international courts and tribunals and how we distinguish them. Uh, where, so where do we stand now? What are the consequences that we can see uh, that uh, the uh, from from the crisis uh, that COVID, uh, uh, without any doubt, uh, brought, but also also the adaptation of globalization in the new world. We have this. Um, uh, for this uh, uh, proliferation of international courts and tribunals, but as I said, they did, they, this doesn't create, has not created a system, a, an international judicial system. So far, tribunals and courts really very much stand by themselves, but they face sometimes very similar, uh, similar, similar issues. So one of the great development uh, that we can see uh, that globalization and um, the creation of international courts and tribunals is cross-fertilization between them. So you see that both in procedural matters, but also in um, on, on uh, substantive matters, international courts and tribunals cross-fertilize. So you see a more a similar procedure being developed by international courts and tribunals and similar issues being developed also, being approached in a similar way. Um, and this is interesting, for example, on issues of maritime law and the, 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 um, specifically the definition of boundaries. We see now that the same approach uh, that's called a three-step approach is uh, used both by ITLOS, the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and the International Court of Justice to resolve and address uh, boundary disputes. So we have cross fertilization between different courts and tribunals. Um, in terms of procedure and in terms of the adaptation to globalization and, and, and the COVID crisis, we also see um, the creation of hybrid hearings, uh, the use of hybrid hearings much, much more commonly. Uh, and obviously we are here now gathered on, um, on team uh, but this is how uh, very often uh, now courts and tribunals meet. So, for example, the meeting last last week of the International Court of Justice, the hearing of the International Court of Justice uh, last week occurred indeed on a hybrid format. So when Judge Donahue was reading her judgment on the Kenya-Somalia case, um, she was joined by part of the court, but uh, while some other members joined uh, on um, on Zoom, uh, like the public uh, did, uh, and the hearing also um, the pleading um, last week was also mostly done uh, by uh, by electronically, uh, but uh, but there were some uh, counsel also present present in the Hague. So we see that technology has changed how courts and tribunals uh, operate. Uh, and the, the existence of international courts and tribunals has also changed how they operate. There's also been, because courts and tribunals have now produced several, uh, uh, probably hundreds uh, decisions, and in the case of human rights courts, actually thousands of cases, we also have seen that there is kind of a critical mass of judgments uh, where um, in several instances, there is a desire for reform. And in some cases, also a renewed criticism of some of the international dispute mechanisms. So there are several reform processes that are uh, underway now. And I hear that actually you talked about the reform processes at Ancitral um, and at, at, uh, at ICSI last week. So I will not go into depth there, but together with the reform at ICSID and at Ancitral, 
We also have other instances of reform uh, in other forum, for example, the human rights, uh, the human rights courts um, in Europe, uh, process of reforms also in the African courts uh, and many other forums too, looking at how to be sure that we are now addressing what the needs are, that we are responsive to the desire of parties to um, to resolve disputes uh, peacefully, but also by providing um, by providing uh, um, judgments that are enforceable uh, and and that parties uh, can implement. Um, there have been criticism of international courts and tribunals, and and some have brought, for example, to the withdrawal from compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Of course, the country where I'm talking to, the United States, has withdrawn from the compulsory with the jurisdiction of the court a long time ago, but more recently has also withdrawn from several treaties that provided jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Kenya, a few days before uh, the issuance of the Somalia-Kenya case also withdraw its compulsory jurisdiction. Um, the court seems to me to have several, uh, many, many uh, cases, uh, and as I said, a variety uh, of, of matters, uh, but most of the matters actually come from uh, bilateral treaties or multilateral treaties that have a dispute resolution clause that provides the International Court of Justice for dispute resolution. Uh, very rarely do they come from a compulsory jurisdiction declaration. There's a crisis on the WTO, uh, and I'm not sure if you spoke about that already, um, but if you haven't, very briefly, the WTO uh, appellate body is now in name only. There are no members of the appellate body that have actually been named. This is very much, this was very much something that was um, kind of finalized by the Trump administration, which refused to select and uh, no, name new appellate body members. Um, but the crisis is real and the crisis is felt uh, by, uh, but of course the entire, the entire world as the WTO now becomes incapable of resolve, resolve, issue, uh, resolve disputes uh, as, um, as it is mandated to do. And the International Criminal Court has also faced uh, some, uh, some crisis of its own, um, especially for uh, uh, criticism by, on one side, focusing maybe too much on African states, and some others by possibly enlarging its jurisdiction to cases uh, where some countries have said maybe they don't have jurisdiction. Uh, of course, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction based on both territorial and uh, so personal and um, subject matter jurisdiction based on territory and nationality um, and has opened a certain um, investigation in, uh, for example, in Afghanistan, which was something that was very much criticized uh, by the United States, which has not been, which has not signed International Criminal Court statute, uh, but its troops have been under investigation for acts in Afghanistan, which actually has signed the International uh, Criminal Court statutes. So my last slide, please. So what, where, what are the views of the future? Where do we go from now? Um, I try to today give you a little bit of a, an introduction to what we think about what are these resolution mechanisms? How we how we should think about international courts and tribunals? What are international courts and tribunals? What are the similarities? And how do we distinguish before between them? Um, I also mentioned the fact that in some circumstances they have uh, being they have um, kept up with uh, uh, with the time they faced issue of globalization and resistance to globalization um, and have adapted in it, their statues in different format they have also been able to uh, start processes of reform uh, that are still underway uh, so to me pro most probably the adaptation will continue we will see more and more hybrid hearings i don't think we will go back to where we were before, we will have, uh, we will continue to have hybrid hearings, especially on uh, on hearings that are uh, uh, brief, uh, in, in brief in nature. Uh, they maybe do not have witnesses, uh, but are, um, um, but can be can be possibly can be done also 
uh, from, um, from afar. Uh, so that we will not only make it possible to for more people to witness uh, the the hearings and participate in the hearing, um, but we will be uh, also be, um, if I can say that, also be compliant with possibly environmental requirements and 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 travel uh, and travel less. Uh, I believe a lot of the reform processes that are underway will be successful. Um, for example, in terms of ancestral ISDS reform, uh, we, we already see some low-hanging fruits that will be um, possible to be, will be adopted. So I have participated in, in the drafting of the first draft uh, of the Code of Conduct for Adjudicators, for example. And I see that as very, very likely to be approved in the November negotiation here that will happen online uh, and in person in Vienna. Um, and there's a really a, a high likelihood of a code a co of conduct to be uh, adopted. And this is a very, very significant uh, development because uh, a, the possibility of creating or holding uh, the same ethical standard for all who work in international arbitration uh, involving investment is, is a very significant development and will be able to make to globalize and and unify the system uh, and make it fairer also for all parties involved. At the same time, we also have the ICSA rules amendment process, which is very much underway, uh, which will also be um, finalized soon. Other reform process, I think, will involve the U European Courts of Human Rights, especially on matters of enforcement of its decisions. Uh, but also, sometimes the European Court of Human Rights is seen as a victim of its own success. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights is seen as is one of the very few tribunals, very few courts that hears individual cases. And it's been very successful because it hears many, many cases. Individuals use the human rights courts uh, from a variety of reasons and from a variety of, of places. And of course, the European Court of Human Rights is not only limited to the European Union, but cover all of the members of the European Council. So it has jurisdiction over 800 million people. Um, and uh, here are cases, of course, after they're heard in their, own, uh, in their own domestic system, but has jurisdiction to hear many cases. Um, there is now a reform process with new protocols that have been uh, um, discussed about how to deal with the influx of cases, how to make sure that the court can hear cases uh, efficiently in a timely manner uh, have been some some of the reforms options that have been discussed and also approved have been maybe uh, hearing one in representative cases so a bellwether case so that you hear one cases and then you decide uh, the court is decided on on a, on a group case on a, on a variety of uh, cases similar cases by only hearing one um, or providing different benches, so one judge, so that the court can sit uh, in different composition also. Uh, finally, how to address other mechanisms, uh, other, uh, other criticism of, the, of international courts? Um, I think it will be very important to continue to strengthen compliant mechanisms. The European Court of Human Rights recently also uh, re, uh, uh, um, strengthened its compliant mechanisms uh, by including, uh, by strengthening the um, the, the um, committee of ministers, foreign ministers that oversees the the, um, the compliance um, of its decisions and its judgments, um, and I think it's very important here. What we see in terms of compliance, um, we really need uh, states, uh, member states, to show that they want these decisions to be um, to be applied and complied. Um, if an interesting example is the Chagos Archipelagos case, an advisory opinion that was, uh, um, was recently decided, listened to, uh, um, uh, published by the International Court of Justice, where the court really says that it is a matter of the international community as a whole to comply and apply its judgments. So we really need uh, states to, um, uh, and member states, uh, to strengthen the compliance and make sure that the judgments that, uh, that are issued are enforced and complied with. Uh, we will continue to see cross-fertilization among the international courts and tribunals with the development of that practice, both in terms of procedure, how to plead, uh, how to hold hearings, 
um, um, how to uh, uh, select uh, uh, councils, issues of evidence, uh, but possibly on, uh, on uh, specific uh, substantive issues also. Um, and then uh, I think we will also continue, and I think it will be very important to, con to continue to provide access to international adjudication to non-state actors. The, as, I, as I've said before, the development of, of allowing individuals themselves to uh, access directly international courts and tribunals is a significant development. Uh, and one hope that it will continue not only on, some reg on a regional base for, internet, for human rights, for example, in Europe, uh, but in other, including in, um, um, in the Americas, um, in Africa, and hopefully in, um, in Asia. Non other non-state actors would also include um, non-governmental organization, NGOs, that may have a standing on human rights, especially when we think about environmental issues, for example. We have a lot of global issues that would require new uh, and um, innovative thinking. Uh, issues of, of climate change uh, will need to be seen, uh, will need to be addressed by this resolution mechanism in an innovative way. And one way to, uh, to do it, I believe, is to also grant access to more non-state actors and providing new kind of procedures and new kind of remedies also, because it's a global problem and also requires some uh, new uh, global remedies. Now, this concludes my... Um, my presentation, but I very much uh, look forward to uh, to talking uh, with you and uh, um, maybe having some um, questions, uh, Q and A. So here's the picture, beautiful picture of the Peace Palace in The Hague that hosts the International Court of Justice and also the PCA, the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So I thought it would be um, a fitting final slide. Very much, thank you very much again for having me here today. Thank, very much looking forward you, to the question. Thank you, Professor Giorgetti. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation and voyage through all the uh, mechanisms in dispute resolutions, tribunals, international, uh, regional tribunals, and also criminal tribunals. In fact, let me just... Uh, uh, I cannot agree more with your uh, prediction that we will see a much more fragmented picture in the in the future. And we, we need to adapt and we need to adjust by bringing, as you said, non-state actors more in play. We see, for example, victims being present in the International Criminal Court, which was unique, a pioneer example where not only the prosecution and the defense appear before the judge, but also the victims uh, separately uh, repre legally represented in, in the International Criminal Court. A huge difference does this make comparing to the previous practice of the ad hoc tribunals. But also, I would stress, uh, and you, you, you pointed it out, the environmental cases where NGOs play a crucial role. We have seen the case with Gendra versus Netherlands recently, where an NGO gender with representing 860 citizens of Netherlands successfully challenged the uh, lack of uh, sufficient commitment of the government, of the Dutch government, to the agreement of the European Union to reduce uh, emissions of uh, uh, CO2 as human rights issue. Effectively, they argued that the future generation will suffer our children will suffer if the government does not commit and ignores the climate commitments. Extremely interesting case. You know, usually judges are very conservative. They don't like to judge in any uncertain future. But this time, they really showed a remarkably uh, willingness to consider uh, the future generation as victims of climate change, of the lack of uh, enough climate change. I can see, and, and by the way, similar cases are now in several other countries, in Norway, in uh, Belgium, in uh, United States, and so on. Let me just for the students to try to make a little bit of clarity in, uh, uh, I will say, separating the mechanisms that are purely for dispute resolutions 
As you mentioned, Chapter 6 uh, established the Pacific settlement of disputes through negotiations, mediations, and arbitration. It's very clear. And when we go to Chapter 7 already, so when peace fails, then the Security Council moves to sanctions and use of force. And then it also creates criminal tribunals, as you pointed, Rwanda, Yugoslavia, and so on. But somehow these are no longer I will put this this way, peaceful settlement. At some point, the criminal tribunals already deal with something substantially different. It's no longer to make peace, it's rather to make justice, to deliver justice for uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, and so on, crime of aggression, potentially, and so on. So in other words, I will put the criminal tribunals as a separate category, not uh, really peaceful, rather than, in fact, the opposite, justice making, sometime in confrontation with peace. Often, ICC, but also the ICJ, I, ICTY, were blamed for uh, not helping the peace in those situations. But the task of the criminal tribunals is exactly not to make peace, exactly to dig back into the war crimes. Sometimes that is confrontational, obviously. So the task of the criminal tribunal is definitely not peace. It is justice. We assume that long term justice and peace will come together, but short term there will be certainly tensions here. Uh, so I will put criminal tribunals, and you, you did it, you, you put it this as a unique type of tribunals. First of all, they were created by the United Nations Security Council. Another controversy was raised there, whether a body aimed at peace and security as the Security Council can create ad hoc tribunals. I think that debate was more or less uh, resolved with the idea that exactly long term those tribunals are supposed to prosecute and punish the perpetrators of war crimes, therefore uh, establishing uh, peace. And we and we have good examples here. If we look at the situation today in Croatia, in Bosnia Herzegovina, in Serbia, in uh, Rwanda, uh, Liberia, after Charles Taylor had been prosecuted, we'll see that criminal tribunals long term do deliver not only justice, but they're also instrumental for peace. And uh, similarly, it's interesting to compare the criminal tribunals with the human rights tribunals. In one uh, sense, the criminal tribunals is where states prosecute individuals, where the human rights tribunals are where the individuals prosecute states. It's the, the, the other way around, quite interestingly, because for the human rights violations, individuals are those who suffer and they file cases against states that commit the violations. What, what is quite curious to see is one case called Brankovic, somebody who died in the NATO bombing in Belgrade in 1999. And she, actually her relatives, she died in that incident, but her relatives attempted to trigger the jurisdiction of the International Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, claiming that NATO members of the European, uh, the European NATO members committed that crime. It was not successful. The ICTY dismissed the case, saying that they are dealing with serious war crimes with large uh, consequences. But then the same appellant, the, they file a case in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, and they were successful. But in fact, the Human Rights Tribunal has a higher uh, threshold to prove human rights violation, life of uh, right of life in particular. So Brankovic was not successful in ICTY, uh, but it was successful in the in the Human Rights Court. So, in other words, the individuals challenging states, and that's what I also very much 
uh, thing will happen. The human rights courts, even domestic human rights courts, can challenge decisions that go against individuals. Remember Cadi case against the Security Council Resolution 1373, establishing a mechanism and counter-terrorist list of individuals against whom sanctions were imposed, but the uh, person who suffer from the financial restrictions, Cadi, successfully disputed the uh, Security Council Resolution 1373, successfully arguing that the list, the blacklist annexed to the resolution, which included his name, uh, was wrong. He never had anything to do with terrorism, but he was wrong, wrongfully listed, blacklisted in that uh, resolution, annexed. So hu human rights uh, tribunals are important, I would argue, as a kind of a counterbalance to otherwise significant powers of the Security Council and the Permanent Five. So I think that development is also interesting to witness and to monitor in the future, as you said. But again, thank you very much, uh, Chiara. It was wonderful and it opened so much more to deliberate and to discuss. I will give you now Ankit, who will take care of the moderation of the questions and answers. Uh, and I'm happy to listen from now on. I, at some point, I need to go to another meeting, but I will be with you in the next 20 minutes at least. Thank you. Um, I just want to stay with that uh, last point what Professor made uh, in respect to uh, regional courts of human rights. Uh, we had Professor Sergei Sayapin speak uh, a couple of in fact, last month on regional human rights courts, and he imagined or shared with us an Asian version version of this. And uh, Asia is not a geolo geographical feature like Europe is, although you highlight in your presentation even that is problematic. But I just want to see your opinion on this uh, Asian human rights court, and he sort of diversifies it into an Islamic version for Islamic states and another version for another geographical area, such as Southeast Asia, but really under the chapeau of an Asian Human Rights Court. So I was quite intrigued and wish to know your opinion on that. I have a couple of other questions as well, but um, perhaps we can have one question at a time and then forward. <clears throat> Thank you. Very, very briefly, I'm not sure what... Uh, the, the lecture specifically was about, but I think there are two, way, two kind of ways to go about uh, human rights jurisdiction. Uh, and I think that on, on one side, we can think about a global court and cyclically people say, well, we should have a human rights uh, court. Uh, similarly to the International Court of Justice have a court that has specific subject matter jurisdiction on human rights issues. Um, of course, that, that would be a very interesting um, Me mechanism. Um, and I think it would be quite interesting to see whether it is possible. There are loads of obstacles, uh, not uh, one that is quite, quite uh, I think, important is that if you grant access to individuals, then these global human rights courts will be just gigantic and will be very difficult to get. Uh, the human rights courts, the European Courts of Human Rights, for example, has one judge per country member, so 52. Um, um, then what do you do for, you move it to the global setting. So if you think about human rights jurisdiction courts globally, uh, like what, what is the future? I think one option would be to try and look at that, but I think the feasibility is quite uh, uh, difficult. Uh, in terms of creating a human rights courts for Asia, there might be the other alternative. Um, so I think that it depends very much again how it is done. The different formats and examples now that exist, and I think the uh, African Courts of Human Rights is quite the African Court with the Chamber on Human Rights is quite different from uh, from all the others that exist. Uh, the European Court has has different also. They all started by being a commission, uh, and then they kind of moved uh, and uh, and and kind of went separately. Although of course they all cross fertilize and. Uh, very often the Inter American Court of Human Rights cites the European Court of Human Rights, um, and not so much vice versa, but maybe a little bit. Um, 
So that would be another option. I would think that it would be, I mean, I, again, ideally, uh, I think it would be ideally better to have, uh, to develop um, global systems rather than regional systems that could address issues uh, more globally. But I think feasibility is different. And uh, maybe strengthen what we have in terms of human rights um, instruments that exist now at the, Europe, at the, at the United Nations. Those exist, uh, and I think that we that can be used a little more successfully. Um, mm -hmm. Professor Popovsky, Popovsky just said something about environment. So very recently, in the Human Rights Committee actually said something about human rights, about environment, uh, which is quite important, recognizing the right to uh, environment, a clean environment, uh, as a human right. Um, so I think we can use and strengthen those instruments also. I'm not sure I reply to yeah sorry Go ahead. Yes, professor just on your last point about effectively utilizing the existing systems so what do you feel about the reservations that are imposed on the jurisdiction of these courts and tribunals as in if i take the example of india in front of icj there are a plethora of reservations which which range from Jurisdic uh, matter within the jurisdiction to self-defense, armed attack, and various other uh, obligations to be fulfilled by international bodies. So, what? How do you feel this aspect of reservation will be na navigated in the future for their effectiveness? Right. Thank you. This is another very interesting question, and I think we can see it in two different ways. On one side, we can see the um, kind of the re realistic approach. Um, we have the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, but it was created, as I mentioned before, the idea was that most countries actually ratify and sign the compulsory jurisdiction clause. This has not happened. And in fact, even the P5, the only country that the, of the P5 member that has uh, still now has a compulsory uh, jurisdiction declaration is the United Kingdom. And the declaration of the United Kingdom is full of reservations also. So I think the strength of the International Code of Justice has been much more resolving disputes that are brought under a specific treaty instrument, uh, uh, either uh, bilateral or multilateral treaties that provide dispute resolution mechanisms. Of course, those, uh, the in terms of reservations, we can negotiate um, treaties that have the prohibit reservations, the issues of reservations. But on the other side, when we have reservations, we can find a we see that many more states are able to sign on to treaties. So I think it would be, be it's better to um, have at least a part of recognition of the jurisdiction and including reservations, which is what the, the statute now allows, the statute of the International Court of Justice allows, than not to have um, a uh, recourse to the International Court of Justice at all. I think, however, you also uh, point out to uh, an important problem, which is the issue, for example, of security, uh, of um, when, when a country says that this is a national security interest. Um, and this, of course, is an important caveat because who decides when you have a, a, a national security um, when you have an issue of national security and whether it is something that may, may kind of shield uh, of the jurisdiction. So I think these are important problems. I think what we want to see is to see that, to make sure that um, the International Court of Justice continues to be an effective instrument, but there is also the as I said, we also have to be realistic in the sense that the International Court of Justice is based on the consent of the parties. And states are sovereign states, and you have to make sure that they are um, that they are kind of content and sign up as much as possible. I think what we need to do is to show the International Court of Justice and others, we should show that this is a valuable mechanism, that it provides this resolution mechanism that is effective. Uh, and and resolves uh, and resolves disputes 
uh, and avoid the uh, um, uh, avoid the escalation of disputes. I'm not sure I really replied. I think what we, we, we there is in me there there's kind of a dichotomy in me. On one side, yes, it would be fantastic if all states signed up without reservations and that the ICJ actually had a jurisdiction on all cases. But we also is the the realist in me that says, well, we have to kind of get get what we get as much as possible and show how important it is to have these instruments that are effective instruments and then provide uh, justice to as many uh, uh, dispute resolution and, and, and as disputes as possible and to as many um, subjects of international law as possible. Thank you. But I, I just want to build upon that because uh, the Indian reservation has come at a uh, sort of a reactive uh, force against the, the Jadav case, the ICJ. Now, the Jadav case is interesting because uh, the Pakistani uh, delegation touted it as a criminal case. Now, uh, I have a couple of questions that I've placed them in an order, so I just request you to uh, hear me out in a, and it's a layered argument, but I request you to answer all, all of them separately as well. So the Jadav case comes uh, at least in the Pakistani mind, as a criminal case, which means that the ICG cannot hear it, or at least that's what they said. Uh, the other point which I want to make is on the evidence system of the ICJ. Now, we had a speaker last semester, and he was telling us that the, in the ICG, evidence is not really given a lot of importance. States are often guilty of submitting false evidence, and uh, this is somehow not given much importance by the judges, and sort of just looked away from and not really, not really addressed, and that the staff of the, and this is something which is international staff, which is part of the presentation as well, that um, the staff is really PhD students or students who, who have masters, not really those who have a very solid legal foundation in terms of the practice of the law. And this perhaps can also be said for the judges who really have a diverse background, but are really suited in the academy. The other point which I want to make, and, and this closes well with what which, which, which I was speaking about earlier and what you touched upon in this answer as well, should the ICJ statute then be reformed? Should it be reformed and reimagined in the sense of what the UNCLASA, which is like a package deal, either you take it or leave it, is there on the table? And if it makes sense to you or if you want to abide by these principles, then you go ahead. Because if there is compulsory jurisdiction and if you gradually rescind from it, then what's really the point? <laughs> right. No, thank, thank you. These are all, I mean, uh, complex but important questions. In terms of the statute of the ICJ, so this is part of the Charter of the United Nations, right? It was negotiated in the mid 40s. Uh, the um, UNCLOS was negotiated for over 20 years uh, and at a much later stage. Uh, yes, it's a package deal, but it required a lot of negotiation. I, I, um, there are ways in which the 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 charter uh, and the statute might be considered um, old or needing an upgrade, right? So, for example, if you think about the Security Council, right? We always talk about the P5. Does it make any sense now to to think to still have that structure um, in in the Security Council? Um, in in the ICJ, we have maybe uh, the, the the it provides different ways in which the ICJ has can obtain jurisdiction, um, and the there is a chance there is an opportunity for states to go and sign up to the compulsory jurisdiction, and this has just not been something that states have been willing to do, or not that many states have been willing to do, and when they have. As you mentioned, they have um, this, several reservations, or once they actually see how exposed they become, they, they conclude that they don't want to be uh, linked or they want to be exposed to, to, such, uh, to such an expansive jurisdiction. I think UNCLOS is very different because it only relates to maritime law and, and, and it has a very, very specific uh, mandate. Um, I don't think the ICJ would require a change uh, of the statute for that. Um, I think maybe what we can do is try to encourage states to sign up to the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. Uh, but I think most states know. Maybe what we can say is, you know, if you campaign for a judge, then if you have a judge, maybe you should be 
uh, compulsory. Uh, you should be able to sign. You should be. Uh, you should also have a sign. Sign up to the compulsory jurisdiction. Of course, then you have this issue that um, there is no link between the judges and um, um, and the states. There's no the judges serve by their own purpose. Um, there are other ways in which you can reform the statute. For example, by allowing um, amicus briefs. Right? So by allowing more. Um, um, outside parties to brief uh, or to be involved in uh, in cases um, by strengthening the uh, maybe uh, you know now with the uh, with, with the with electronic filing and others I think it's more it's more possible for more countries to to sign up um, uh, and, and participate, uh, but you have ways also in which the ICJ could be expedite, could expedite its judgments. Um, I don't think that the jurisdiction is one of those aspects that require um, require reform so far. Uh, but I think there are other ways in which this statute can be uh, can be reformed. In terms of evidence and in terms of your first question, there's a very interesting book by Professor Riesman that talks about uh, the issue of evidence also at the ICJ. Um, it is possible, and we know that sometimes evidence has not been, um, uh, the, the states have provided false evidence. I don't think the ICJ would condone that had they known. Um, um, but you always think kind of you give the benefit of the doubt to states. Uh, the judges that are um, that are part of the ICJ are really at the pinnacle of their profession. Yes, some they come from academic, but they academia, but they also have practiced for a long time before before they are named, before they before they are um, uh, before they are, you know they 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 they, 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 they are nominated. Um, and I, th I think you mentioned something about the casual uh, vacancies as forthcoming, uh, but you see also the, the the background of the judges, and you see the variety of their backgrounds is really quite uh, quite astonishing, and I think quite encouraging. Well, let me just shift slightly and and speak about online hearings, and this is really where I seek an American opinion and not an international opinion per se. Because in the Indian context, it's very much, there's a divide. There's a divide in what someone who's recently joined practice and someone who's been in the practice for at least 20, 25 years. There is a drift. The older generation of the, the lead, leaders in the industry prefer an online system because it saves time, et cetera, et cetera. But those who joined uh, seek, uh, seek opportunity to go to court and represent. I mean, this perhaps is also. Uh, uh, was shared with Professor Vasky saying that us for for us as professors it's okay, but for students they miss out. So there can be a parallel drawn. So what, in your opinion, seems uh, as a feasible model? The hybrid model seems like the most likely, but it comes with its challenges in security and safety. So if you can talk about the social and also the safety aspects of this, and in respect to the safety aspects in international arbitration cases, where the, the, the stakes are extremely high uh, monetarily. Right, yes, yeah, so, so thank you. In terms of safety, I think that we have, um, so I don't think we will switch completely to hybrid hearing, but I think uh, more and more we will see, at least for short hearings, uh, we will have more of those. Uh, I think there are, I mean, uh, if you look at the practice, especially of international investment tribunals, you see that they can be provided, that there are, um, many ways in which you can ensure the safety of proceedings uh, by using specific systems that cannot be hacked, um, by providing uh, uh, computers maybe to some of the parties uh, in terms of documents uh, production also. Um, in terms of, so if you're thinking about kind of external threats, I think uh, we, we have sufficient um, the, the software that we created have a lot of security enhancement uh, that provide uh, uh, that, that can make it that can make it secure. Um, in terms of document exchanges, I think is also the same. Um, the maybe one issues that remain might be those of witness examinations, uh, and and there maybe you can enhance the security by maybe. Um, allowing more cameras. We have different cameras that can be that can be brought in a room. Um, 
They can monitor what's happening, they monitor the presence. So I think, I, I, especially during the pandemic, the, um, um, the technology has evolved really quite substantially. Last question, and we can close. I know it's nine o'clock in the US, so I will not hold yes. for long. And uh, perhaps this is this is also a favorite topic for Professor Kubalski on the ICC and the the uh, its African bias or its African uh, uh, fav fav favoritism or, or the preference given to African states in the in the docket of the ICC. So what what remains your perspective on that? Is there actually an African bias which exists, or is there some sort of activism it's through African states that is most relevant in, in prosecution of international criminal acts. Thank you. Another very important question, very interesting question. So the jurisdiction of the ICJ is mostly of the ICC is mostly given by the states themselves. And African states have signed up to many African states have signed up to the ICC. And many of the cases that are now under the jurisdiction of the ICC have been brought by African states themselves. So it is kind of, it's, I don't think there is a um, uh, maybe animus against African states, but it's kind of a signal of how successful the ICC has been in African states. So that many states have signed up uh, to, um, to its jurisdiction. In other cases, um, there has been the remand by the Security Council. And it's true that maybe has uh, it, the, the, the cases have been more focused on Africa. I think it's also an historical moment where the Security Council kind of worked uh, and, and, and was able to uh, to ask the ICC to uh, to engage. I think now the new prosecutor is showing that they are they are trying to diversify. So with cases in, in, uh, in Palestine, in Colombia, in, um, in Asia and others. So I think it's both. It's also um, African, African states have been very much at the forefront of uh, the ICC and have signed uh, in, in an unusual number. And so, of course, they have used the ICC. So I don't think there's any, uh, it's not, it wasn't against African uh, states. Um, at the same time, now we'll see much more diversification. Uh, Professor Kropowski, final words, and then we can close. I think Professor Kropowski's camera is uh, stuck. Well, let me, in that yeah. case, thank you, Professor. Um, we can uh, uh, like to thank you for taking our time for us and for sharing our expert thoughts in a very interesting and riveting discussion. Uh, we've enjoyed it thoroughly and we're so grateful to you and uh, we will now welcome you for uh, uh, visits to our campus and to our university and conduct this lecture physically if possible in the upcoming semester. Um, final words and then Professor, final words and then we can close. I just want to say thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's been really a pleasure and I very much hope uh, that to, to, to be able to come uh, maybe one day soon. Thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. As well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.